Hello, and welcome to National Book Foundation's Book Up at Home monthly author visit series. My name is Andy Donnelly, and I'm the Education Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation. I'm excited to welcome you to our final installment of the 2021 Book Up at Home program. Our mission at the National Book Foundation is to connect people with books. Often that means connecting young people with authors and teaching artists in a book club setting. This year, it's also meant offering these virtual spaces for young people to connect with authors and ask questions about writing and reading. Thank you to our Book Up partners for connecting students with these virtual events. And thank you to our funders at the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We're thrilled today to be joined by author Pablo Cartaya. Pablo is an award-winning author of several books, including The Epic Fall of Arturo Zamora, and Marcus Vega Doesn't Speak Spanish, which is currently being adapted into a film. Pablo's novels have received honors from the American Library Association Youth Media Awards and included on over 30 state award lists. He is currently a faculty member in the MFA program at Sierra Nevada University. His most recent novel, Each Tiny Spark, was this month's Book Up at Home book, which means that students in the National Book Foundation's Book Up program received copies that they've been reading and discussing throughout the month of May. They're tuning in today with questions for Pablo. Pablo also has an important responsibility this year, serving as a National Book Award judge. That means that he's part of the team that's about to read many, many books and determine which books are finalists for, and then which book is ultimately the winner of the National Book Award for Young People's Literature. Pablo is joining us today to talk about his work as a writer and also to tell us a little bit, it's, though it's, it's secretive, the work of the, of the National Book Award judges and jury, uh, to tell us a little about his duties as an awards judge. With that, I'll turn things over to Pablo for a brief presentation. Thank you so much, Andy. I'm, uh, I'm so thrilled to be here. And I just want to thank the National Book Foundation. I want to thank all of you for all the great work that, that, you, that you're doing. If you're watching, I know that we're at the end of the year. I know there's a lot of Zoom fatigue. So if you're watching, I appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you for reading books. Thank you for loving books. And I'm just really excited to talk to you a little bit about who I am, the kinds of books that I write, and then to answer your questions. You know, I think it's such an important thing that we celebrate all kinds of books. And so my role as a panelist for the National Book Awards in the Young People's Literature category is like one of the great privileges of my, of my, of my career because I get to explore and experience all the great work that's being written uh, today. But right now, let's talk a little bit about, about me and my books, um, and then hopefully I can answer some of your questions with the time that we have together. So if you're tuned in, hi, how you doing? If you're outside and because the weather's beautiful and you kind of check it out at another point when it's recorded, then hey, welcome, and I hope you had a great time outside. <laughs> uh, boy, do we need it. But for right now, Let's talk a little bit about why I write the kinds of books that I write. So um, I want to thank the National Book Foundation for choosing, you know, the uh, Each Tiny Spark as the book of the month. It's a very special book and means a lot to me. Uh, it's a book that stars a, a young Cuban-American girl named Emilia Torres, uh, Emilia Rosa Torres. And she's basically learning how to navigate life with her father, who has just returned from his last tour, he's a Marine, he's just returned from his last tour and he's a little bit off. And her mother goes off for a work trip. And so she's left with her father who's a little bit off and an abuela who is a little bit overbearing. Now, if you are anything like me and you had an abuela or if you know what an abuela is, grandma, you know, you can understand what an overbearing Latinx grandma is. I mean, it's the kinds that are like the chancleta wielding, you know, don't you dare, you know, walk into the house without taking your shoes off kind of abuela. Well, that's what Emilia's abuela is. So you can imagine the tension that is built. But that's not all that the story is about. The story takes on a special meaning for me because it's about this kid who is diagnosed with ADHD, inattentive type ADHD. Now, why is this important for me to tell you this? Because my daughter, my own um, teenager, 
um, was diagnosed with ADHD at uh, probably at the age of nine. Now, it was really tough because the first part of her elementary school years, um, she she felt very much like an outsider. She felt like she was not able to be recognized for the type of, of, of neurodiverse thinker that she was. And it was very frustrating. And so when I saw how, how much pain she was in because she was not understood in the right way or understood in the way that her brain works, it was really, it was really tough for me. You know, and as I looked for books and I looked for stories that could help her relate, I found some, but not enough. And so I set about writing a book that celebrated the neurodiversity that my, my daughter has, my daughter Penelope. And so I wrote this story really about a daughter and a father coming to understand each other, right? And celebrating his daughter's neurodiversity. Um, and so I was very, very uh, privileged to receive the Schneider Family Book Award honor for the representation of the disability experience um, in a book for middle grade students. And that was, that was a great, great thing. But the biggest reward that I got from this book, the biggest thing, biggest compliment that I could have possibly gotten from this book is that when my Penelope, when my little girl, when she read that book, she looked at me and she goes, Bobby, this sounds just like me. And that to me, I couldn't possibly um, ask for a better, a better compliment. Um, this is part of the celebration of what books are, right? It's being able to see yourself, being able to hear yourself in a story. That's the beauty of literature. That's why it's so important that we read all kinds of different books from all kinds of different cultures because you never know when you might see yourself in that story. That's why it's so important. My story, right, comes from a long journey of feeling like I didn't have permission to be the hero in my story. And therefore, I couldn't write the kinds of stories that I write today, right? But how did I get to that point? How did I get to that point? Well, it really started in sixth grade. My first experience with writing creatively was in my sixth grade class. So like you're in middle school, like it's an important, very formative time in your life, right? And I was in sixth grade and my teacher, Miss Me, gave me a writing assignment. And she said, write the, write the hero of your story, write a superhero. Now, I was super pumped. Why was I pumped? Because I love superheroes. I was a huge Marvel Comics fan, right? And so when I dove into this story, I got really excited to create this character. And I created this character named Oblab. Now, Oblab is basically Pablo spelled backwards. So if you ever have a writing assignment and you need to come up with a name, just use your name and spell it backwards. And then there you go. There, I'll give you a writing tip. All right. And so I created this character named Oblab. And Oblab was this defender of the universe. And he had a little pet ferret whose name was Inyad. Now, Inyad was my little brother's name, Danny, spelled backwards. And and Inyad was a little bit annoying sometimes, but also helpful at times. Um, and that was like my, my way of like writing my brother into the story who was a little bit annoying. Um, but these two characters went throughout the universe like defending evil and saving the galaxy and all this stuff. And when Miss Mead asked me to describe the character Old Lap, what I did was I wrote him with piercing blue eyes long flowing blonde dirty blonde hair he had this kind of like surfers like california surfers tan super buff and he flew through the universe fighting evil now i'm gonna pause for a little minute and i'm gonna do i'm gonna do something like if you if you've ever been on a zoom or a facetime with like someone who doesn't know how to use zoom or facetime you know sometimes they get like real close like that and they, you see like their nostrils and stuff i'm gonna do that real quick I'm gonna put my eyes right next to the camera. Now, if you could see the color of my eyes, okay? You can see the color of my eyes. My eyes are very dark brown. Now, my hair, right? My hair is also a very dark brown, okay? Now, I was writing a character 
old lap that looked nothing like me. When Miss Me asked me to describe the hero of my own story, right? I wrote someone that looked and sounded nothing like me. And it would take a long time for me to feel like I had permission to be the hero of my own story. Now, I'm going to be really honest with you. I didn't really think much of it, right? I didn't really think that there was a problem with that back then. I was like, all right, cool, whatever. Because Miss Mead didn't say anything, right? She was like, great job. And to her credit, she was like encouraging my creativity. You know, there wasn't a point where I thought this is not the way that you should be describing the, the hero of your own story. I didn't think like that. So I went through school imagining the hero of someone else's story. When I was, I've told this story a lot, but when I was um, 19, I went to uh, LA to become an actor. I was, um, you know, really excited to just, you know, I kind of like hopped in a car and drove with my best friend to LA. I was like, we're going to do it. Let's just go. Right. And for, for a little while, it was pretty good. Like we, I was on a show, I was on a show called Will and Grace. I was on, uh, I was in a Pepsi commercial with Ricky Martin. I was, I was doing a lot of interesting things. And I, I got to the point where I went to an audition for this casting director and this casting director kind of looks, you know, and, and, and tells me, you know, Hey, um, I, I have to ask you a question. So this casting director, I auditioned for this casting director and he stops me and he says, you know, I have to ask you a question. Now I've told this story a lot, but I, I think it's important to repeat this story to understand what can happen to people when they are forced into their own erasure. Right. So I, I, I want to share this story again. If you've heard it, you know, you know what's going to happen. But I, if you haven't heard it, um, allow me a minute to just share. So I went to this casting director and I auditioned. Right. And when I auditioned, I finished and he says, you know, I have to ask you something. And I said, sure. Uh, and I got a little bit excited because I was like, oh, wow, you know, maybe he wants to like cast me. And this is a guy who's in a position of power. Right. So I was like, yeah, so uh, yeah, sure, sure. What's up? And he looks at me and he goes, you know, I just don't understand something. And he looks at my headshot. Now my headshot's my picture with my name on it. And he looks at my headshot and he says, you know, I just can't get why your name is Pablo. I don't understand. And I said, well, that's my name. Right. He goes, yeah, but you don't really look like a Mexican. I said, I'm not Mexican, I'm Cuban American. And I know that I was Cuban American because my parents were born in Cuba, my grandparents were born in Cuba, and they came to the United States in the 1960s. And, you know, I was born here and I knew that that was part of my journey and that's that was it, right? I didn't think, you know, anything else other than like I'm Cuban American. I didn't really think of any other way that I could be, right? I've just imagined that that was me my whole life, right? But this guy tells me I don't look like a Mexican. And I say, I'm not Mexican. I'm Cuban American. And then he turns to me and he says, yeah, but you are not dark enough to be a Cuban. And I looked, I stepped back and I said, what? And he says, all the Cubans that I know don't look like you. And it was one of those moments where I pause and I, and I relive it over and over again because it gives me a feeling of real anger right now. But back then, I remember that I was not angry. I was so confused and a little scared. I was confused and a little scared. And I went to um, this man and I looked at him and I said, I, I, don't, I don't understand what, what, what you're saying. And, and he, he says, you know, what you should do is you should change your name because you don't look like what you say you are. You don't really look like what you say you are and you should change your name. And he was doing it as a way of like giving me advice. And so I left that room and I, I had to think about what he had told me with, and I had to reflect on what he told me. And I ended up, doing what probably a lot of people do in that situation. I went and I changed my name. 
Now I have no, nothing against anybody who changes their name for their own reasons, but I changed my name for somebody else's reason, for somebody else. I erased myself for somebody else. And that is what I didn't realize at the time was a problem, right? Because when I went back to Miami to visit my family, right? My mom and my dad, my dad got a hold of my new headshot and he saw my new picture, right? With my new name on it. And my dad looked at me and he did that thing that parents do, you know, when they're upset at you, but they don't say anything. They kind of just like, just do that. That was my dad. And I didn't understand why he was upset. And when I asked my mom, she says, you know, you have to, you have to dig a little deeper. Now, if you've read each tiny spark, you know, what dig a little deeper comes from Mr. Rick, the teacher in the book, he, he sends his class on a trip to find out more about their community, dig deeper. He tells them. And when Amelia, the main character, when she digs deeper and deeper, she starts discovering things about her own identity, about her own community, about her own culture that she didn't know before. And when I was 19 and I went to ask my mom, why, did, why was my dad upset? She said, dig deeper. So you want to look at the connections all those years later, when I wrote Each Tiny Spark, I remembered that. I remembered what she told me. Because what I did was I started to dig in and I found out that my dad, my dad, when he was in Cuba and the dictatorship of Fidel Castro came in and took over the, the rights of many of its citizens in the country, my father stayed on the island to try and take the country back, to try and fight for his country back. But he lost and he was put in prison and he was tortured in prison and he was there for two years. And I learned this right? By digging deeper. I learned this by learning more about my own history. And I found out that my father, two years after he was put in prison, he was put on an airplane and sent to the United States where he was never allowed to step foot on the country of his birth again. He was considered an enemy of the state, him and his and the other counter-revolutionaries that had fought to take the island back. He was called a traitor to his own country. I learned as I kept digging that my father left behind one of the people that he loved the most in this world, my father left behind his abuelo, his grandfather. I learned that when he left his grandfather behind, he was not able to say goodbye to him when his abuelo passed away. He was on the island. Now, if you think about the pandemic that we, have, that we are, are hopefully, hopefully getting on the other side of, think about how many families lost loved ones that, we, that could not say goodbye. Maybe you lost a loved one that you couldn't say goodbye to over Zoom. You had to do it over Zoom. My wife lost three, her three remaining grandparents last year. And I remember how hard it was for her to say goodbye over Zoom. I remember that. And I thought about that as I remember this story. And I think about how my father must have felt not being able to say goodbye to the person he loved the most in this world. And the thing that I learned next would set me on the course to write the kinds of books that I write now. Because I learned that when I was born, I was only going to be one name because it was the name that my father remembers his beloved grandfather by. You see, I'm named after my great grandfather, Bali, right? And what I did and what I realized that I had done is that I had erased a part of my family's history. I had erased a part of my father's memory, right? That's why he was upset. That's what my digging deeper found is that my dad had named me so he could remember his father, his grandfather. And what I did was I erased it because somebody else wanted to dictate the terms of my identity. And so what I did was I, I told my dad, I'm sorry, Bobby, I'm, I'm sorry for doing that. And I went back to LA and I changed my name back to Pablo. And when I changed my name back to Pablo, I set about studying everything about my culture, everything about my community, everything about my family. And I went and I studied it at the university. I studied writing and I got a degree in English with an emphasis in writing. And I went full force into my creative cultural endeavors, right? And what do I mean by that? My creative cultural endeavors was I wanted to write with characters that sounded and looked like me. And when I've started writing, guess what happened? I started writing characters that were 12, 13, 14 years old. Why? Because when I first started writing, when I first started doing my creative writing, what 
what, what grade was I in? I was in sixth grade writing Oblap, who looked and sounded nothing like me. So for me, going on that journey, coming back to write, I started writing characters in that age group that looked and sounded like me. Characters that have culture, community, and family. So that I could see myself as the hero of the story. And that one kid somewhere, somehow, could see themselves as well. I want to thank you all so much for just listening to my story briefly. Um, I'm really excited to answer questions. I know Andy's going to be fielding them. Um, and and um, yeah, so, you know, here we go. Let's Let's get this going. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the for telling us about your journey. Thank you for telling us about about your life and and uh, what brought you to write the books that you're writing. For folks tuning in, uh, if you have a question for Pablo, use the Q and A feature at the bottom. That question will get sent to me, and I'll and I'll ask it. So make sure if you have a question, uh, we've got we've got time for it. Send that question in, and I'll make sure to ask it. Our book up class opened up each tiny spark and started reading it. Um, and one of their first questions about the book uh, was why you chose to include so much Spanish, um, why there was so much Spanish incorporated into the book. And a few of the student, students noticed that you were able, in each case, you often rephrased it or told us a little bit for, the, for, for folks who don't know Spanish, you do, a, uh, you do the work of sort of giving us some hints as to what's being said to make sure that folks are following along. So I'd love to just hear more about, about both the choice you made and how you crafted that, how you used so much Spanish in this, in each tiny spark. Bueno, para mí, la, la idioma de español es la idioma de mis padres y mis abuelos. That is the language of my, my family and my heritage, right? My grandparents. We speak, sometimes for us, uh, words start in, in English y terminan en español. That is the language that we speak. We speak in 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 bilingual sentences, oftentimes code switching between languages and phrases and, and euphemisms and all kinds of stuff. And so for me to write a story that has a lot of Spanish in it is natural to the way that I live my life, right? I speak to my mom, I speak to my dad in Spanish. I'm, I'm like constantly code switching, right? And so the, 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 the way that I construct my stories is to say, look, I am going to show the readers that this is how I think. I think in these two languages. But being that I'm a writer, I'm not going to try, I'm not, my intention is not to alienate you from the, a language that you may not understand. Right, so I'm going to do what we call context clues. So my hope is that you read a you read a phrase in Spanish, and you don't maybe you don't understand it, but the next few sentences will help you to connect. Right, will help you to connect what to that what that meaning is, and I will always do that in my books. It doesn't matter. I'm you know if I write uh, contemporary realistic fiction or or a new book that I have coming out next year, which is about you know uh, set 120 years in the future about you know the last bee colony on Earth. I'm still going to write bilingually because that is how I represent my my culture, right? That's how I represent um, my family and my community. Um, and my hope is that with those, um, with that kind of exchange that you have with the words, you're able to kind of you know connect with me, like I'm writing directly to you, like hey. You may not understand what I'm saying, but I'm going to help you to understand as you connect. And then if you are a Spanish speaker, it's like, I'm speaking to you. Like, you get it. You understand what I'm saying. You know, like, we got you. Like, I'm with you. Like, I, I listen to you and you're listening to me. We're listening to each other. And so that's kind of where I'm at with that, you know, and, and, um, and yeah, and I appreciate, I appreciate the question and I appreciate the, the, um, the connection, right, to, to those two things. Yeah, thank you. I, I think students had that exact experience too. Those who speak Spanish feeling like they, they really, you know, that they were speaking to them and those who didn't feel like they could follow along with the context clues as you describe it. Uh, we've got a few questions coming in. You talked a little bit about this um, in, in the beginning, but folks want to know if there were, uh, in addition, you, you mentioned your sixth grade teacher and her encouraging you to write were there other teachers or other adults who encouraged you when you were younger to pursue reading and writing? And, and how, how did they encourage you? Um, I had a great poetry teacher in college. Um, 
who encouraged me to write the kinds of words that I write now, you know, um, I had, you know, my mom, <laughs> of course, my mom, she's going to take full credit for this, but so, well, well, whatever. Um, my mom, you know, one day I was like, I was, I was struggling. Like I, I was having a tough time, you know, with the kind of identity that I wanted to represent because I didn't want to be like a caricature of what a Cuban should be or whatever, you know, like, what does that even mean? Um, and I was kind of struggling with that part of my identity. And I was probably around, around the, the eight, I was like around 19. My 19 was a huge year for me because it was like a really transformative. And my mom told me, she's like, you know, you, you are a very good writer. And she said this to me and I was like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. And she, and she, I have to give her props for it because she did say it. Like she, she was like, you know, you could write for young people. Like she said, she goes, you could write children's books. She literally told me that. And I was like, what do you mean write children's books? Like, first of all, if I'm going to write, I'm going to write serious books, you know? And she was like, oh, those are serious books, you know? And, I, and she kind of like smacked me around and said, dude, what are you, what are you saying? And, and, and my, my, and so basically, I mean, like, you know, I, I, I have to tell her like, since it's, since it's going to be recorded for posterity, I got to say, mom, you were right. Okay. There you go. I said it now it's forever. It's like, it's on the internet now it's forever. <laughs> so yeah. So that's, that's kind of, my mom is a big influence on me and she's one of the, she's one of the first people to read my work. Um, you know, but I will tell you this, just because it's mom does not mean that she holds, hold back. Like she's a brutal critic. Brutal. We, we actually have a question that just came in that's just about this very topic uh, that um, you talked about your daughter's reaction to your books, but uh, folks want to know if have you, what your parents' reaction has been to your writing. How have your parents responded to, to reading your books? Um, so my mom, my, my mom is... She is, she's a, a, a very emotional person. Like, like, and what I mean by that, like anybody who knows my mom knows exactly what I'm like. She's like, she's like, you, you walk in, Andy, if you come into my, into my house, my mom would come and hug you and be like, Oh my God, look at you. How are you doing? You know, and like offer you food and stuff like that. So it's like, that's my mom. So when my mom read each tiny spark, um, I didn't know that she had read it, but I had sent her the manuscript. Um, one of the galleys I had sent her and, and I didn't know that she, I didn't know that she had finished it or whatever. And she calls me and she's like, Oh my God, Pucho. Oh my God, Pucho. They call me Pucho. That's my, like my nickname. There you go. Now you have some tea on me. Um, oh my God, Pucho, Pucho. It's so bad. I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What happened, mom? She goes, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Like this. She starts like, Oh my God. And she starts like crying. And then she starts like, talking about the last scene in the book. And I'm like, oh, it's the book. Oh, so you finished it. And she was like, so um, connected with the story. Uh, um, unlike unlike the other the other books that I've written, like she was so connected to this one. Um, and then my, my dad, I'm gonna see if I can pull it up. Cause my dad wrote me a text that was, it was like, my dad is a man of few words and he, he had sent me this text of like, I'm not going to find it. It's anyway, but it's, he sent me this text of like, Pucho, this book has incredible depth and it will be a very important book for, uh, for, the, for your, for the community that we represent. And he was just like very stoic about the way he responded to it. And he sent me this text and then he put the Cuban flag emoji on it. And, and then he goes, great job. And that was it, you know? So that's how they reacted to it. Um, and then the rest of my family are just like, they, you know, they go and they share it with everybody. Like, you know, oh, that's my, my nephew, the author. That's my, it's a big family. So it's like, cool. Like that's part of the awesome thing about my, you know, like my community is that, everybody's very supportive, you know, um, and they all kind of take ownership of, of your, your stories. So it's kind of fun. That's really wonderful to hear both of your parents' reactions to each tiny spark. Do you feel the same way about each tiny spark? Do you feel 
like this book has a more special place for you than than your previous writing? I know that you're supposed to tr treat all treat them all equally, but I wonder if if you feel the same way about each tiny spark. I mean, look, like I think that like the epic fail of Arturo Zamora was a cathartic book for me because it was the one that that sort of like that I needed to write for my abuelas, for my abuelita, you know. Um, I needed to write that book, and Marcus Vega was. Marcus Vega doesn't speak Spanish was a book for my brothers and for the community, you know, um, for the down syndrome community, um, which I've been, I've been, um, involved in and my family has been involved in for many years. Each tiny spark is, is like my love letter to my daughter, you know, and to any, anybody out there, especially girls who are diagnosed with ADHD and who don't feel seen or who feel or who are overlooked because they're girls, you know, um, that was, it's, so it's very personal to me. I, I, I feel very, very connected, um, to it because of how my daughter connected to it and, and how I've seen a lot of kids and I've spoken a lot about this book and, and I'll get, and I'll get, um, young people and a lot of, a lot of girls that come up to me and they're like, I have ADHD too. And I love this book so much. And it's so great because I can finally hear myself in a, in a story and this and that. And it's like, it's so touching. It's so, um, wonderful to, to feel that. And it's just a great privilege. It's a great privilege to, to be able to, um, lend a voice to, um, to all those, all those kids out there that, that don't feel like that representation is there for them. You know, and I hope that they get their stories out too, and and that's that's my hope. But yeah, this book is is really um, really deep uh, for me. Yeah, that makes sense, and that they're that they're inspired to to write and tell their stories as well. Uh, we have students who want to know if you weren't an author, what would you be? I'd be like a rock star pianist. Okay, probably. Who who like like did cameos in movies, um, you know, so probably something like that. Um, I, I love performing. <laughs> I love, I miss being on stage. Like I love like going out and like performing and, um, small crowd, big crowds, whatever. I, I really enjoy that aspect of my career. Um, so I would either be some kind of a musician or like a stand up comic or something. Like I just, I love, I love writing material and then getting on stage and performing it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the zoom thing kind of like limits us. Like I'm sitting in my chair right now, but in my head, like all I want to do is stand up and move around. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> like this, um, but, but yeah, I like, I like performing. Yeah, so the, the pandemic sounds like it's a real challenge for engaging with audiences. And though we're able to do events like this over Zoom and, and get folks connected this way, uh, students want to know what your workday is like. Uh, do you have a set schedule for writing? I think students would be interested to hear what your workday was like before the pandemic and then, and then what your workday been like for the past few months or the past few years. The, the past year, has the pandemic slowed down your work, uh, made it more difficult? What's the work day like? Um, okay. So pre-pandemic, I was traveling a great deal. So a lot of my writing um, was, you know, it was more sporadic, right? Um, I kind of, I was doing a project. I was right. I was, you know, doing a project, but then I was traveling, you know, 15 days out of the month. Um, and so that became kind of a, a challenge in its own way, you know, so I was traveling a lot, which is really fun. I was performing, I was doing all that. That was great. But then the actual writing was, was, it was difficult to carve out in, like, uh, enough time. So I was really, really exhausted from all the performing, which again, I loved, but you know, to keep writing is kind of the, the, the deal, right? That's kind of my job. Um, so with the pandemic, you know, I'm, I'm always somebody who I, 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 I'm, I like to, um, take action. Like I like to, you know, if something gets thrown at me, I want to take action. I want to participate in what's going on, whether it's, you know, protesting in the streets or it's, you know, um, 
you know, this is what's happening right now. This is what we got to do. And it's, it's, it's very much tied to, I guess, the way that my parents, um, you know, worked. I mean, they're immigrants and they, they worked really hard and just kind of like hustled and try to find whatever they could find. So with this, with this, um, situation that happened with the pandemic that everything shut down and that basically like all travel stopped, um, I, I had to, I had to figure out what I was going to do now that I wasn't speaking and going and traveling so much. And what ended up happening was that I started writing a lot more and I ended up, I ended up writing three books in, in the last year. Um, those two of those are coming out in 2022 and, and I wrote a screenplay and it's like all of these you know, so I kind of just shift gears. I shifted gears and said, okay, well, I'm, I'm not speaking anymore. I'm, well, I'm speaking, but I was speaking via zoom and it was more sporadic, especially at the first part of the pandemic. But, and so what I said was, well, I have to go and I have to do something about this. I have to then do what I'm supposed to be doing is which is writing. And that turned into, um, these, these projects that now I'm finishing. Now I literally just turned in two books, um, today earlier this morning. And, you know, the, the other side of it is, it's like, it allowed me to pause and to look at what's look at the world as well. And, and to be active in what's going on in the world. And I think that that's also very important, um, to be socially aware. Um, and that's a big message of each tiny spark, um, is, is to, you know, take a step back and look at what's happening around you. Right. And what, what do you see that maybe um, doesn't feel right and get involved in that way? And I, I think that, you know, what it allowed me to do is instead of like all this travel and going and going and going and going, it kind of allowed me to pause and look and say, there is a lot of stuff that we need to fix, you know, in our world, in our country, in our communities. And, you know, can we be the people that do that, you know, as individuals towards our community, towards our, states towards our country towards our world right and um and that's kind of that's kind of what happened with me with the pandemic is that i sort of um it it allowed me to wake up to things that i was missing and then also allowed me to work on the things that i wanted to do next and write next Speaking of which, I was saving this question for later, but since you mentioned the two books that you finished today, can you tell us any more about it? I know maybe you can't, um, but is there any preview or uh, enticement we can get about the upcoming? Yeah, so, yes, book? so I have, yes, I have one. It's, all right, so it's my, it's my first foray into um, sci-fi, science fiction, whatever, you know, it's kind of like takes place 120 years in the future. Um, basically, um, there are no more bees on earth and these, um, and life is basically just starting to get back online. So there's this whole faction of, of individuals that are starting to bring things back online. And there's this, this other faction of like these farmers who are trying to rebuild. Um, and these two sisters find, um, the last bees on earth in the, in the, in the woods right by their farm. And they discover that their abuelita left it there for them before she passed. So that's basically the, the premise of the, of the book. And then it's sort of like this epic battle and there's robots and drones and like all this cool stuff. And, and this sort of like new type of internet that's existed. And it was so much fun to write, but also like just part of, you know, the reflection of our world today, um, serving as kind of like an allegory, um, you know, but setting it 120 years in the future. Um, so that's kind of what my, you know, the next book. And then the other one I can't tell you about, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's really fun and it's, it's tied to, uh, uh, tied to a TV show. And that's all I can say about that for now, but it's definitely going to be really exciting and you'll, um, You'll, uh, Andy, you'll be the first to know. I'll send, I'll send, when I'm great. allowed to say it, I will let you know. <laughs> great, great. Thank you. That sounds cool. Both sound, both, I'm intrigued about the second one. Uh, the first one, the sci fi story sounds pretty, a cool premise to imagine what maybe our, our scary 
future without bees. Um, uh, a question that just came in, you mentioned the experience that you had with the casting director. And uh, we have a student who wants to know whether you've had any similar experiences in, in the book world or similar experiences in publishing where you've been made to feel similarly. Um, the, the short answer to that is yes. Um, and, you know, there, I mean, look, when you're a person of color, you're going to have microaggressions all the time. They're not, they, they don't have to be overtly racist and, and yeah, it, 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 it's happened. Um, I, I push through, I call it out when I see it. Um, and I also just push through and, and, and just continue to, use my voice and whatever platform I'm given to speak about the pride that I have in my identity and who I am. And, and, and that's, that's the way that I, um, contend with, with, with that kind of, um, limited thinking, you know, so that's, all, that's the way that I approach it, you know, um, and you know, that's, that's really, the, that's really all I can say to that. Yeah, that makes sense, and that sounds like um, a diff. I mean, it's part of the experience that Amelia Rosa uh, discovers and 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 contends with, and and gets really and develops an activist mindset about in in each tiny spark. Uh, I, I want to ask a, uh, a question for me that there's a lot in each tiny spark, um, a lot happening in the novel. Uh, Amelia Rosa is, is learning about the injustices of immigration. She's learning about her father's trauma. She's developing her own sense of identity. Before this book, I don't think I've ever read a book that deals with a phenomenon that's becoming more and more common in school districts, especially for rural schools, and that's school consolidation. There's a, a story that's sort of central to, to her experience in school of the school districts consolidating and students from one school are possibly being moved into another school. And so I wanted to ask, um, and there's a lot of anxiety about it in the town. So I wanted to ask a question about where that story comes from and how you thought about incorporating that form of, of sort of social reality into the, in, into the book. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and I thank you for the question. And I, 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 I like, I like to write stories that have multitudes in them. Like there's, there's, there, there isn't just a linear storyline. That's just one. It's fine. I mean, there is a, a main thread, but there's multiple things happening within the, within the world of the, of the story. And because I think, especially with contemporary realistic fiction, but any kind of story, there's, there's things happening on multiple fronts. The world is not existing in some static fashion. It's existing in multiple places, right? And so this idea of writing about redistricting in this community was something that was really important because, I mean, quite literally in the town, there is a railroad that splits up one side of the from one side of the town and the other. And then how many towns like this are there, especially in the South, where that sort of segregation by technology, segregation by this sort of train system has happened um, over many, 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 many years. Um, and then when you talk about school redistricting, I really wanted to explore this idea of like, what does that mean for both sides? What does that mean when a product, you know, when a, a school district that has a school that has mostly people of color in them that all of a sudden gets repurposed and, and those students of color get sent into another school? Like, I think that there's a misguided um, viewpoint to say like, oh, well, they're just going to be happy being in the all white school, you know? Um, and I think, and I wanted to, to kind of speak to that in the story too. It's like, not everybody is going to be happy because they have to get uprooted from their, their school or, or, or their, you know, um, uh, education, you know? And so it contains multitudes, like it affects a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And so it's not just this sort of, um, I mean, it's not this sort of just like box, very neat little box that we can understand the complexity of it. There is a lot to unpack and to discover about this. Some people in, in a predominantly white, smaller population of school are, you know, might not be happy with the fact that, you know, there is people, students of color coming into, into their schooling. Some of them might. 
right? The same as the is is with a school that has mostly students of color. And so, where do those where do those um, stories come from? And I think that it's important to, as you step away from it, is to reflect like there are multitudes in these stories. There's the it affects people in very different ways. It's not just one monolithic experience that says, well, this is going to be good for you and this is going to be bad for you, right? It's very complex. And I wanted to explore that in the story as a way to, you know, to honor the complexity of the experiences that are being affected by these sort of things. Yeah, thank you. And it's and it's left unresolved in the in the novel as well. I want to run through a, a couple uh, quick questions here. Uh, students ask, why do you give the books the titles that you do? Where do the titles come from? Just randomly. <laughs> like, I mean, uh, so um, the epic fail of Arturo Zamora and Marcus Vega doesn't speak Spanish literally just came to me. I was like, ooh, the epic fail of Arturo Zamora, this is what I'm going to write. And it's always been that, has never changed. Marcus Vega doesn't speak Spanish was the same. East Sunny Spark took a little bit of, of, of you know, um, creative development with my editor, um, partially because originally it was like Emilia Rosa does, does something like this. And like, it, like it was something like that. And my editor was like, all right, so why don't we branch out from your long titles? Right. And let's think of something else, you know, instead of like the name so that we can like branch you out. And I was like, at first I was like, what do you mean? This is like my calling card, you know, like really long titles. Um, and after I thought about it, I was like, you know what, you're right. Um, and so I kind of played with some, some ideas and then, uh, settled on each tiny spark because what, what each tiny spark and, and maybe somebody who's, um, maybe there's different ideas of what each tiny spark means, but what it means for me, um, uh, when I, when I settled on the title was each tiny spark is basically like every little piece, right? And you know how Amelia loves puzzles. It's like every little piece that you find is a piece you can put together to make your whole, right? So every little thing that you discover, every little idea that you come up with is pieced together, pieced together to make this whole that makes who you are, right? And, um, and just that idea really sat with me. I was like, oh, this is, this is exactly what, what it is. And so, um, that's what I settled on. You know, it's funny. Nobody, nobody, me uh, messes up the epic fail of Arturo Zamora. Um, the title, nobody messes up the title. Marcus Vega doesn't speak Spanish, but I can't tell you how many times people was like every little spark, um, little sparks, um, each, every little spark, you know, like I get like, so many people telling me all the different titles, whatever, but it's like, it's interesting that the one that I worked on is the one that people kind of like not don't always like get, but I really like the title each tiny spark. I love the book cover. Um, I love the font of it. It's so, so cool. So I'm just really proud of this book. I'm embarrassed to report that I right as we were getting started, I had to search it again to be like, double check that I have this right. Uh, having confused it <laughs> in my head a few times. I think it's, um, well, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I know. That's right. I know. I don't, I mean, I don't hold it against anybody. I just know that that happens with this title. It's funny. Uh, another quick question here. Do you read your book reviews? Um, if they're starred, yes. <laughs> no, just kidding. No, no. I mean, I, you know, um, you know, there's, there's certain, there, there's certain, you know, reviews that, you know, like, you know, there's Kirkus, School Library Journal, um, there's Publishers Weekly, you know, Hornbook, and then like, there's really great bloggers that review books. I, I do like to read the reviews, not for the self-adulation, right? But more like, okay, what did this person who was carefully thinking about this book, what did they, what did they come away with? You know, it's not anything that I'm going to take back. I'm not, the book's already written. I can't do anything about it. So there's a certain disconnect that I have when I read it. It's more like, well, what did this, what did this person take from the book? I appreciate reviewers. Um, why? Because they've taken the time to read the book, think about it, right? 
and and make a reflection on it. So I'm looking at it like that when I read it. I'm not obsessing over the reviews. I don't typically go into Goodreads to read reviews. Um, you know, a lot of people have their opinions about Goodreads. I have no problem with Goodreads. I think that that's a community of readers and they want to chime in on, on their reviews of books. I think that's awesome. I don't personally go in there because there's a lot of, of information that passes through there. So I'm just like, I'm, you know, I'll stick to the reviews that are flagged for me or the ones that I see in the, in, in the media. And then I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, reflect on them and say, okay, cool. You know, learn from them, appreciate the comments, you know, and that's how I, that's how I kind of like approach it. That seems like the right good attitude. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the national book award judging process? Uh, what your responsibilities are, what you're asked to do? Well, you, you understand that I am sworn to secrecy on pain of death, Absolutely. right? <laughs> okay. So what I, what I share with you now is going to be very limited because if any of my colleagues or any of the good people at the uh, committee are listening, it's secret to head. me as well uh, as a national book, a national book awards or national book foundation employee. It's also, you're telling, you're revealing the secrets to me. <laughs> so it is, it is a really great um, experience. The, the colleagues that you are, working with are amazing you know they're they're selected and i you can tell that the, that there is a lot of thought that goes into the selection of the judges um and i really appreciate that because it's kind of it's this mix of you know academics who study who who study the field and then also you know established writers award-winning writers and so you you kind of you're you're kind of experiencing it with colleagues and then you're getting to see all the books that are coming out there, right? You're getting to see all and read all these books. Now, I've, I've heard a lot of people come and say, oh, my God, there's so many books to read and so many books. Yes, there are a lot of books to read. You know what you're getting into when you read, when you sign up to become a judge. Um, it's really cool, though, you know, like it's like you are at the front of all these great stories that are being put out that these publishers want us to read to consider. And that's really exciting. So you see all kinds of great stories. I, uh, you know, I love seeing the, the, the breadth of, of stories that are out there from all cultures and all communities. I love it. It's so exciting. And and then it's fun to just chat with your colleagues about, you know, the books. So it's kind of cool. Like, it's just, a, it's like, it's like getting to do what you love to do and then chatting with your friends about it and then really kind of deliberating and kind of going through the process and seeing, you know, um, what stands out and what doesn't. I'll sneak in one quick question from the, from the perspective of a, of a writer, what's, what's important about the awards? How do you see the National Book Awards or awards in, awards in general, why does this matter to, to writers and to the reading world? Well, I, I will say this. I will say that you should never write for an award. Like, you should never write a story with the anticipation that you could be considered for an award. Like, if you're a writer, write the best story that you can write, right? Do I think that awards are great? Absolutely. And why? Because what they do is they provide an opportunity for readers to connect with a story they may not have otherwise connected with. You know, I'll give you a perfect example, Case and Kalander, who won the National Book Award last year. You know, how many people are going to watch, are going to connect with their book, right? And, and how amazing that story is to so many like case, you know what I mean? And, 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 and so many people that have access to a story like that. Right. So I think that the awards provide that opportunity. It provides an opportunity for readers. It should not be for the writer to push, to write a story that gets into consideration, right? For the writer, write the best story that you can write. Right. And let all that other stuff take care of itself. But for the reader, 
the awards and the lists and all that stuff are awesome because when you're looking for to if you're a librarian if you're a teacher if you're any you know you can look to these lists look to these long lists and these short lists and look to these finalists and then look to all of these um different awards and say oh that's a story i didn't know that had come out Maybe I can, maybe let, let me look at it. Like, oh my God, you read the book. And you're like, oh, this is a great book for my classroom. You know, and that's what I really love about it. Awesome, thank you. I think we have time for, for just one more question. So I'd love to ask, now that students have read uh, Each Tiny Spark, what else would you recommend? What's next for them? What would you, re and, and know that we've got summer reading coming. So what would you recommend, especially for, for summer books? For um, to pick up? Are you, I'm sorry, are you there, Andy? I missed your last part. Oh, ju just saying that with summer reading happening, uh, oh, what do you suggest I'm, for summer? I'm books? struggling to hear you, but um, you, I think you, I think you said recommend some some books. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Got you. All right. Yes. So I, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to recommend some stories that were not published this year because of part of my, my role as a judge for the national book awards is, um, to not comment on any books that are in contention for this year. So I'm going to recommend some books that were already, uh, published in years past. Um, I want to start with, um, there's a wonderful book. It's called Black Brother, Black Brother by Jewel Parker Rhodes. Um, it's it's a middle grade. It's a little more. It's it's a, a mature middle grade book. So for for those readers that really like to like dive in, it's a great story um, uh, about a 12 year old named Dante uh, who's a black biracial uh, boy uh, with a white passing brother who goes to an all white school. Um, and the book, you know, kind of talks about his um, struggles with racism, figuring out how about his identity and the school to prison pipeline and, you know, which also threatens to swallow Dante up. So it's really, really good. And it's kind of like, I, 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 you know, if people like each tiny spark, this is a great, this is a great book to, to kind of dive into. Um, there's another one that's really fun that I read. It's called, um, dragons in a bag by Zeta Elliott. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily like uh, this super high literary book, but it's, it's a, it's more like an urban fantasy, um, follows this character named Jackson and he's a young black boy is, and he discovers that the elderly woman, his mother calls Ma is actually a witch. And then he accidentally releases dragons into Brooklyn. Um, it's, that one's really fun and, and really very cool. There's a couple of them on my list here. I want to, you know, the, oh, this is a great middle grade book too. Stand Up Yumi Chung is awesome. Um, it's about a Korean American kid who's, she's, um, she's in a, uh, she's a middle school student and she's an aspiring comic, which is so cool. Um, and she's kind of got going through her, her, you know, like, like the mix between her like Korean identity and then her American one. And then like wanting to, to sort of do something that's like off of the, you know, um, traditional, what, what her parents like, or what her mother is expecting for her. And so it's a really great, very funny book. Um, another one written by, um, my colleague, um, at the national book, uh, award committee, Evie Zavoy, my life is an ice cream sandwich. This is a great summer read, you know, um, it's sci-fi. It's, it's like this, this kid who she kind of goes from, um, Alabama, she goes to New York, to Harlem, and then kind of discovers all these like really cool things about science fiction. And, and it's just a really fun summer read. Definitely recommend this one. Um, there's, I mean, honestly, I think, what, I think this, I think March, and it, as you can see, um, the late John Lewis signed it, um, March, this is a, a three box set. My, my kids have the books with them. So <laughs> I, I don't have it with you right now, but this, this book should be on every single, um, school reading list. Um, it, it covers the, the civil rights movement in a graphic novel with amazing detail. And I think is just an extraordinary, extraordinary, um, uh, story set series of stories that that follow John Lewis's life and his involvement in the civil rights movement. Um, just a really, really amazing, powerful book. Um, and for students who 
you know, who are not inclined to reading long, big texts, who like, who kind of are drawn to uh, graphic novels. It's an awesome, awesome way to connect with a really powerful moment in history, an important moment in history, and also like sort of like using the creativity of graphic novels to sort of tell that story. Um, you know, there's, I could, I could be here all day. I could just recommend whatever, you know, but, um, uh, but those are some, so those are some that I love, you know, and definitely, um, recommend, um, you know, again, another one that's like, like this sort of uh, feeling of identity is the other half of happy by Rebecca Val Valcarcel. Um, and she's this, the character, uh, Kihana is, she's a half Guatemalan 12 year old kid who's like struggling how she always feels like she's in the middle. And I know that for those of us who are like hyphens, like I'm Cuban hyphen American, I know like there's a struggle to feeling like you're like, don't really belong in one place or another. Um, this is a great book. Um, she's, she's, um, uh, it's like it's like the book focuses a lot on the cultural identity and how Kihana feels like her father is embarrassed of how little she knows about her heritage and the language and um, especially when their family comes to visit. So I think it's like it's a great book for somebody who who is feeling like they're part of a culture but not connected to that culture and they feel kind of like outside of it. Um, that's a really great one too. So. I hope that gives you some some ideas, and since it's being recorded, you can always go back and rewind and see it, whatever you know, um, you know. But those are great stories, and and just you know, keep looking at all the great books that are being written today. I think they're really, really awesome and and important, and really reflective of the world that we live in. You know. Awesome, Pablo. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for uh, for joining us this evening. And thank you, everyone who's tuning in tonight, uh, this evening, um, for what is our final Book Up at Home virtual author event for the year. So thank you for joining us for any and all of the Book Up author events that you've joined us for this year. You can watch all of the previous Book Up at Home author events on our webpage at nationalbook.org forward slash book up. You can see the talks from books that Pablo mentioned. Uh, talks from E.B. Zaboy joined us earlier this year. Case and Calendar joined us earlier this year. You'll see videos from Rita Williams Garcia, Lillian Rivera, Tracy Chi, Christopher Paul Curtis, and Jarrett Krasowska. Uh, so thank you all for joining us for Book Up this year. I hope you all have a wonderful and safe summer. Have a nice night. <laughs>